Hey everybody, it is Drags Mike Petralia back with the latest episode of Code Reds on the CLNS Media Network. This week, I welcome into the studio the one and only Mark Sheldon does a tremendous job covering the Cincinnati Reds for Reds.com and of course MLB.com. Mark, thanks so much for uh, taking time out out of a uh, busy schedule and certainly it's a busy time of year as the season begins. Thanks for taking time out. Sure, Mike. So uh, the Reds are off to a five and four start. They win their first two series at home against Washington. Of course, that dramatic win on Sunday afternoon on the back-to-back homers by Will Benson and Christian and Carnacion Strand, his first hit of the season. Then they go on the road. I thought this was a terrific series, uh, and you were in Philly for this, uh, taking two out of three from the Phillies, and they were really battling the elements literally on that last day. What a long day that Wednesday was, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh... Of course, it was supposed to be a one o'clock start. Unfortunately, we knew the night before it was gonna, they moved it to four o'clock to try to avoid the weather. And I think they ended up getting more weather than they expected. And it became a three hour and 55 minute rain delay. I think that might be the longest rain delay I've sat through in my, in my career. Um, I know I've been over three hours a few times, but wow, 355 is a long one. But tell you what, uh, I feel lucky that they got those games in. Uh, yes. I, I know the Mets and Tigers had to do a, they got two games banged and had to play a doubleheader on Thursday. And that's what we were looking at uh, as a possibility in Philadelphia. So to avoid that was, was splendid. And, and, uh, and they played a, a, a mostly good series and against a, a team that hasn't woken up fully yet, uh, but is expected to probably pretty soon. Yeah. And, you know, a couple of things I took from that series. Uh, first of all, the Spencer Steer Grand Slam on Monday night. That Monday night win, uh, as solid and all around a good win Wednesday was, I thought the Monday night win when they were down 2 nothing, uh, and really uh, struggling to get on track, get anything going offensively, come back, battle back, tie that game, and then make their way to the 10th inning in the Spencer Steer Grand Slam. To win that game, to me, really said a lot. And, a, and one more thing before I let you answer there. Alexis Diaz, two days earlier, had blown a save against the Washington Nationals. In that game, he comes in in a very high leverage situation, gets out of the jam in the eighth inning, sets the side down uh, in order in the ninth, and uh, manages to pick up the win in that game. Yeah, it was big all around. The uh, Diaz, like you said, blew the save, and then – in an odd, you know, different situation. It wasn't because he's not the closer. It wasn't because of any kind of demotion. It was they were facing a very tough part of the lineup. He was actually up in the seventh inning. So I was like, wow, what's he going to do here? Right. And they got out of the seventh. And then when uh, when Suter got into a little mess in the eighth, uh, Diaz came on and took care of it. And and he looked great. That was just a big series. They were they were being uh, handled very well by Christopher Sanchez, the, the left-handed starter from Philadelphia, yep. uh, about five six innings. And Abbott was doing very well himself, and he he had gave up a basically a dink for a, a two you know for a two run double in the first, and that was all he gave up. And uh, to be able to pull that one out against a very good starter and and get away was was a big thing for them. And then obviously to win Wednesday again. And, and avoid, uh, you know, and avoid it being, you know, losing a series was huge. And Frankie Montas pitched great, and they beat their ace, uh, Zach Wheeler. So it was a lot of, a lot of good things from that series. What are the growing pains you think Ellie De La Cruz is going through right now? The biggest ones. Well, certainly on defense, just too casual, too, too much trying to be, be uh, sensational. Maybe too much flair. Maybe needs a little bit more meat and potatoes. Just do the basics and, <laughs> you know, catch the ball, flip the ball with your hand instead of your yep. glove to second base. You know, make the plays. When you get to the, when you get to the, uh, when you kind of like in math, if you, once you figure out algebra, then you can move on to calculus. You don't, you don't just right. go right to calculus. And I, I think him doing those things will be okay. His strikeouts are certainly alarming, especially considering what he was doing in, in spring training. He was, even though he was striking out a little at a little bit of a high rate, he was still waiting on pitches, being patient, taking his walks, and hitting the opposite field. And you're not quite seeing that to the same degree as you are uh, in the regular season. Although he, he he kept the hitting streak going for for a good long while here, so um, got some work to do. Certainly, he's not 
he's not a perfect guy yet, but he's 22 and, and there, there is, there is work to be done. And unfortunately for him, it's, it's a lot is on his shoulders with all the injuries they've had. No question about that, Mark. And uh, one thing that impresses me though, about Ellie is I think he has the character, the comportment, the way he handles himself uh, on the field and in the clubhouse. I don't think he lets the noise get to him. And I think he'd probably, from all indications, and, you know, I'd love to get your opinion on this. You would know him, know the situation even better than I do. Um, he seems good at blocking out any noise or any criticism from fans or people that have nothing to do with his day-to-day -day performance. I, I generally get that impression, too. Uh, he doesn't seem to be, in a way he carries himself in the clubhouse, he doesn't seem to be, be too bothered by anything. Um, not to say that he doesn't care, because uh, he does care. Right. And, but I don't think he cares about the things that he doesn't need to care about. And he cares very greatly about, about performing well in the field and, and, and having success. So uh, we'll see. It's certainly only a handful of games. You said five and four, there, there's nine games in, there's a long way to go for him to show what he can do and, and, and see if he can not necessarily bring back what he did the first month of his career last season, but to certainly have a little bit more dynamic offense. Well, and I will, uh, I want to bring this up and it was a question you raised, uh, on the, believe it was the first homestand. And that was why it was so important. Actually, it was right before the, the season opener, I believe, Mark, when you asked Ellie why it was so important for him to learn English and communicate with the fans, I thought his response was terrific. And it's one of those things I want fans to kind of get a little bit more insight. If you could offer that, what, you know, what inspired you to ask Ellie that question? Well, I noticed during spring training, and you probably did too, is some of the questions we'd ask, he'd respond in, in English in small amounts. And I, I've, you know, since he came up here, I've been able to say, hello, how are you? And he's responded in English. It's, it's not like he can't speak English. But I think also when you're trying to be a superstar, you want to communicate in, in you know, one-to-one, -one, direct, without any middleman. Right. It, it, there's... There, the, it's a very important to be able to speak to the, you know, what he said, he wants to be able to communicate with the fans where the media is the conduit for him to communicate to the fans. He wants to be able to communicate to the media directly. So his message is, is unfiltered mm -hmm. and, and Jorge Merlos does a wonderful job as a translator, but it's, yeah, but I don't need you anymore. I loved, yeah. I loved his answer. Yeah, <laughs> when it was you great. Asked him, I don't need you anymore. He was great. And I, I think it's, it's, it's engaging. And, and honestly, to be truthful, I think there's an economic component to it too. I think it's yep. a lot easier to get sure. endorsements. He already got one with uh, with the Jordan brand, but certainly I'm, I'd like to imagine he has ambitions to to be a spokesperson for for different companies, both global and local. Those those commercials for Alta Fiber and and uh, Jeff Ruby's or whatever they all yeah. add up, and I, I think that that could help him too. So. Uh, I, I just, I just, you know, over the years, I've seen players kind of start off with not speaking much English and kind of learning the language and doing very well. And the best case I can come up with is Eugenio Suarez, hmm. who really didn't speak much English when he arrived at the Reds from the Tigers. And he's one of the most personable players I've ever dealt with. And other players have been less comfortable with it, whether it's Johnny Cueto, Aroldis Chapman, uh, most recently, Luis Castillo. They always felt like they needed a translator. Uh, and I don't blame them. I, I want to say this. And I was talking to Brett Suter about this uh, when I was talking about De La Cruz is I don't think people grasp how hard it is to do interviews that are going to be seen by thousands, if not millions That's of people. The That's what I told Jorge after that language. press conference. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Mark. It It's one thing to try and learn a second language and then do an admirable job. You, are, you have cameras rolling. The entire fan base is watching you. And also what I thought was very interesting, very telling is – Ellie's not just doing this for our sake. He's doing it to reach the fans. Yes. And and part of his answer to you when you asked that question was the fans need to understand me and I need to understand the fans. I, I love that answer. That's very important. And fans want to be able to have engagement. And I'm sure there are fans out there that understand Spanish and, and could listen to his Spanish responses without the need of, of Jorge. But it's always better to speak direct and you, you, nothing gets lost in translation when you speak directly. So it's, it's, uh, it's cool that he does it. I, I certainly wouldn't want to be plopped down into the Dominican Republic 
and asked to do an interview in Spanish. I took Spanish for five or six years in, in you know, high school and wow. college. I'm certainly not fluent, but even if I learned Spanish, I'd be very challenged to, to try to give an interview and speak Spanish in it. And, and Brent Suter said as much. He tried it in Venezuela and eventually he, he couldn't do it. He had to go to, to a translator. You know, I had good friends with Jessica Camerato from our days back in Boston, and she is, as you know, now the Washington Nationals reporter, and she speaks very fluent Spanish, and she did so when she was covering the Red Sox, spoke a lot in Spanish, and it does give the players a bit, I don't want to use the word crutch, but it does give them some comfort level and it allows the reporter to get to know them uh, that much better. She used it in the NBA when she was covering the Celtics uh, and the 76ers. But, you know, I've talked to her many times about that and she says she'll speak in Spanish um, in bits and pieces, but she doesn't want to become too dependent. Like if they see her talking all the time in Spanish, they'll only talk to her in Spanish. They, She wants them to feel free to speak in English. I, I find this dynamic very, very interesting because it, it's kind of telling about how a player wants to adapt uh, to the environment here in Major League Baseball. Yeah, and it wouldn't hurt for reporters, quite frankly, if there's a reporter that's like young reporter or high school, it really wouldn't hurt to stay with Spanish, you know, become masterful in Spanish. Also, Japanese certainly wouldn't hurt, yeah, depending on the market you're in. Uh, I, I wish I stuck with Spanish and, and really I had no idea when I was in college that I would be a, a, a reporter covering baseball and speaking to Spanish speaking players uh, as often as I do. And if I had known then what I know now, I would have stayed with it. Yeah. Uh, wrapping up the Ellie De La Cruz topic, he does have the 17 strikeouts in just 33 at bats through nine games. That's part of the deal. He's got to work through that. But I will tell you this, Mark, and I don't know if you agree with this. For a guy that struck out 17 times in 33 at-bats, his knowledge of the strike zone and his plate discipline is still very good and above average. Would you agree with that? I don't know about the word plate discipline, if I'd go that far, but I would say that he he knows he's learning what pitches are good for him to hit. And I know that the, the ratio, the, 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 the more than 50% ratio does not reflect it. He he does have some sort of pitch recognition because he saw it in spring training. I know, I know it's a different caliber. They were not always seeing the A pitchers. They were sometimes minor leaguers. But you saw a guy that seemed to know what he was looking for. And, and, he, and he said over and over again in spring training, he, he needed to wait for his pitch and swing at the pitches that are good for him. Now, why he's going away from that, hard to say. I mean, pitchers are just very talented. It's a, it's a hard racket baseball and it makes you do things sometimes you don't want to do in the batter's box so i, I i'm eager to see what he can come up with uh and, and see if he can bring his strikeout rate a little bit lower all right let's go to the uh, other side of the uh, ledger if you will and that's the pitching and i think the brightest spot uh so far this year maybe two very bright spots one picture has seen the results in his records and statistically uh the other uh, has not, but he has looked very strong. Of course, I'm talking about Frankie Montas. Um, he is 2-0 and this year with a 0 0.77 ERA, two starts, 11 and two-thirds innings, and I've got the numbers right here. Nine hits, just the one run earned. It was a solo homer. I think Frankie Montas has set a really good example for Hunter Green, and Hunter Green has come out and said so. And by the way, that other picture we were talking about is Hunter Green. He is... Um, certainly shown that he has the ability now to really reach another level. I think, Mark, I think that's safe to say that uh, Hunter Green is starting to show some maturity. But Montas and Green, what are, what have been your takeaways in watching them two times through the rotation? Well, certainly Montas has been adver as advertised in a lot of ways. The, the talk was if he's healthy, these are the kind of things he can do. And he's shown he's been healthy. He came to spring training extra prepared a, a lot of people were saying he was almost season ready when he got to camp and that was in january and mm -hmm. certainly they had to be careful but everything he did in spring training he had one bad start which is fine and he looked great in spring training and he was doing all the things that you want to see a veteran guy do he was talking to the young guys he was talking to the old guys he was talking to the clubhouse staff he was talking to everybody he went on red's caravan i mean you don't see a lot of veterans go out on caravan. Great point. And he wasn't even on the team for a month and he went. And I, I just think 
as I wrote in my story the other day, he, he's really hit all the right notes since he's come to Cincinnati. Most importantly, he's done it on the mound. Then, uh, and then when you get to Green, I, I think it's good that he's got a, a, a someone that he can watch, take it, you know, learn from. But I, I honestly, I don't think Hunter Green should need to watch a veteran to know the, the basics of throwing strikes and going up after hitters. This is what he's been asked to do for two full seasons. So I'm glad he's learning, and I'm glad maybe he's seeing up close and personal what it can do if he throws strikes. But I mean, he's had Nick Lodolo do that since he's been here. He's had Graham Ashcraft do that since he's been here. Um, so I don't, I don't know why Frankie Montas is the, is, is the, the light switch that he needed to, uh, to, to turn it on and, and, and try to do that. Like he did the other night, he looked very good. I didn't think he looked as good in his first start. Certainly the, the fielding behind him wasn't helping him, but he still right. throws a lot of pitches. He still nibbles at the strike zone. He, he doesn't have a, a firm third pitch yet. It's developing. I, I think he's got right. a long way to go to be what they want him to be, but certainly this, this last start was extremely encouraging. Yeah, I just got the sense from his tone after the last start uh, against the Mets on Saturday that he's starting to develop an attitude, if you will, maybe reaching a, di a different type of attitude and a different comfort level. Maybe. Uh, it's, it's hard to say two starts in. It's it, it, it's, it is. It's That's good to true. see that he's doing things. I, I just, you just want to see it longer. You want to see it over consistent uh, weeks, days, months, and and we'll see what happens. But I, I think, I mean, no one has, can doubt that Hunter Green has the ability to be a superstar pitcher in this in this league. I, I still believe that. It's just now we've had two years, and it was first year was certainly you know he didn't have the development. He missed time with Tommy John, and it was a rebuild year, and, and there was kind of like a, an opportunity for him just to get in it and and learn. Last year was supposed to be a rebuilding year, but it became a bigger, a bigger and more important year than people expected. But he he was there for a while, but it was still a lot of hiccups along the way. And, right. and this year, they really need him to be one of the big five starters so they can have a chance to make the playoffs. And there's going to be less room for learning on the job. I mean, great that he's learning from Frankie Montas, if that's what it takes, but the young man needs to be one of the best starters in baseball and give them an opportunity uh, to make the playoffs, and he needs to reach his, reach his potential. As I was filling in for the one and only Mark Sheldon, uh, covering the Reds over the weekend, and thank you very much for the opportunity, Mark. Had somebody from the New York Mets broadcast crew come up to me and say, you know, I think for all of the players on the Cincinnati Reds that get the attention, the one player that doesn't is Spencer Steer. Yeah. And that was, of course, you know, moments after uh, he hit the uh, game with the go ahead home run, the three run homer uh, in the eighth inning on Saturday uh, in that uh, nine to six win. Steer's numbers, nine games. I get that. It's we're still early on. 406, three homers, 12 RBIs. He's slugging 813, OPS 1313. Do you think that Spencer Steer in, in many circles in baseball is still underappreciated? Certainly. Uh, we saw him last year. He was uh, voted the Reds MVP right. just based on his overall numbers. And honestly, you could argue he was one of the least known Reds last season just because you look at the, he lacks the – the, the pizzazz of Ellie De La Cruz and certainly the the awe-inspiring tools. I mean, I think Spencer Steer's got a lot of tools, but Ellie De La Cruz has it's all five, and they all are ex ex except you know uh, unbelievable. But he also had Matt McLean. You had other other players come through that just seemed to be getting more attention. And, and meanwhile, Spencer Steer just kind of keeps his head down and just keeps playing. And he played four or five positions last season. Uh, He's, he can bat him anywhere in the lineup, and he just sort of gets it done. And it's it's, it's pretty remarkable. He doesn't have the flash. He doesn't have the, the you know look at me kind of stuff. He just plays baseball. He's yep. a he's I, I, it's so weird to call this. He's just a baseball player, and I know he that's a throwback, Mark. He is I a do a throwback. He, he yeah. just he's, he puts his brings his lunch pail to work and goes to work, and it's it's uh, it's it's he's a he, he just is a good all around player. He does everything you want to do. You bat him second, you bat him seventh, he produces, and he's just a, a guy that you you want to see in the batter's box with an important 
uh, moment on the line here. It's it's if you if you need to win a game and it's the ninth inning, I would take my chances with Spencer Steer if I'm the manager of the Reds. I, I think he's a glue guy at this point. I mean, in terms of his production, I'm not talking about, you know, his clubhouse impact yet. I think he certainly last year was still officially a rookie, but third, the second year with the Reds is, you know, part of his third season with the, the organization uh, after being acquired. Um, you know, I just think that Spencer Steer is one of those guys that David Bell can rely on, put him in the lineup and he's going to produce. I agree fully. Um, He's done well enough in left field, but if they put him at third base, they put him at second base, they put him at first base, he could also produce. And it's just offensively, he's just at a very sound approach. And when he doesn't strike out a lot, mm -hmm. there was a there was a point last season where he was about one to one on walks to strikeouts eventually, but he hates striking out. He told me that last season. He absolutely hates to strike out. So you got he's a guy you put the ball in play, and I've long heard. From, uh, I remember Ron Gardenhier when I covered the Twins. Just he he wanted it, once you put the ball in play, anything can happen. You can make something happen. Nothing can happen when you strike out. And he always said that. And I just think I know that's not so silly and basic, but it really is great to have a person in your lineup that you you won't have to worry about whether he can put the ball in play and, and create something. And that's what Spencer Sear does. You had a terrific article about Will Benson uh, learning the craft and refining the craft of playing the outfield, but specifically center field. That's come in pretty handy, Mark, uh, yeah. considering the fact T.J. Friedel in training camp, late in training camp, uh, spring training, went down with a uh, fractured wrist. Um, give us some of the highlights of what you learned in writing that article about Will Benson and how he has not only improved his approach at the plate since he debuted with the Reds, but improved defensively. Well, just bringing it back to last season, he came to uh, the Reds late, like right before spring training. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, knowledge about him, at least on the media point point of view, other than he was a first round pick who seemed to just not succeed in Cleveland, and he he, he was he was just didn't have a, a lot for all the tools he had and the athleticism, he just seemed to be missing at the plate. And then just defensively, just watching him in, in right and left field and a little bit in center, he just. I, I, I'd use the word, some of his plays, whether they were outs or not outs, it just seemed fraught with trouble, like weird routes, taking a step back instead of coming in, taking a step in instead of going back and going to his left instead of going to his right on the first step and things like that. You, you, you know, he made the plays a lot of times just because he's an athlete and he could make it up with his speed, but not every play looks smooth. Not every play looked clean. And, and he did spend a lot of time in the offseason working on it. He works a lot with uh, Colin Cowgill, who is the first base coach, but also the outfield coach. And the, the, the two of them have, have found ways to get him to be more responsive off the first step, to read balls off the bat better. He's constantly kind of moving his feet a little bit to be ready to move in any direction he needs to when it's time to, to go to work. And and make a play. So it's, it's been uh, through nine games, certainly small sample size, of course, but I have watched him make several routine plays that were maybe were less routine last season. Uh, he did a lot of it in Philadelphia, especially yeah, you point uh, that out. And he also made a spectacular play. Obviously it was a game they were losing, but Bryce Harper was killing the reds on Tuesday. Uh, but, but he made this really great catch in center field and, you know, they certainly miss T.J. Friedel, and they're a better team with T.J. Friedel, but they are getting over this hump and, and this void in center field because they have Will Benson out there. Smoother and cleaner, I believe, were the two words. Those two words are really important, Colin Cowgill uh, told Mark Sheldon on Friday. The big focus for him was being under control. He's such a great athlete. Uh, that he thinks about being fast and thinks about being quick, and it slows him down. When he's naturally smooth and naturally free, he's just much better. Terrific yeah. quote there. Yeah, it's true. And you're seeing a guy maybe who's not thinking as much, and he's using his instincts, and his instincts are paying off. You know, one thing about Benson that's kind of, if you look at his minor league numbers, he seemed like he always had trouble the first year at a level, and then year two, he seemed to, he seemed to, you know, find his footing and, and take off both offensively and maybe now defensively. So it's, uh, it, it's, it, if it, this is a, uh, a big year for him, the, I mean, the Reds, I think already won that trade last year based on what he did to loan last year. This is a winning trade for them. Uh, 
but they really could have a guy that could, is poised to break out this season. And, and it could be him. You know, when Friedel comes back, I suspect he'll move to right field. But uh, Benson was a platoon guy essentially last year, and now he has a chance to be an everyday player. And part of that is his offense, but it's also his defense. He, if he if he's a liability on defense, he's not going to play every day. And, and I think if he's as long as he's good on both areas, he has a chance to be a regular. Heart goes out to TJ Antone, huh? What happened on yeah. Sunday? I mean, we're obviously recording this on Monday. He's getting an exam. He's getting an MRI on his right elbow. What struck me mon- after the game Sunday when uh, he came out uh, after throwing just one pitch in the top of the sixth inning was his the reaction of his teammates, specifically Brent Suter. And it, he used terms like gut-wrenching, heart-wrenching. You wanted to give him a hug. Why is that, Mark? Why why is TJ Antone so beloved inside that clubhouse? Well, first of all, he's a good person, and he also he went through two Tommy John surgeries. Um, especially with the you know the first one happened in the minor leagues in 2017, but the one he had in 2021, he, he you know it was heart wrenching to watch the guy walk off the field in Milwaukee, and and hurt you know with a bad elbow and. He had to go through all that stuff again. And what one thing that was always said is that he was the guy out in Goodyear during the, the rehab time that really rallied the other players going through Tommy John and, and long-term injuries and long-term mm-hmm. rehabs. And he was the leader and he would make it more fun for them. He would create competitions and, and incentives and, and, and bonding. And so that he's so you he already kind of established he's a good guy and you always don't want to see good things happen or bad things happen to good people. And then you, you throw in, he finally gets back last season. And after five games, he, he, he has an injury. And it's not his elbow necessarily, but it's certainly elbow adjacent. And he had to shut it down. And it was it's tendonitis. And that, that was heart-wrenching because he, had a, he, he was having a good results. And then this year, uh, the, the only question was, could he stay healthy? And he was trying to do the things the right way. He was abandoned the idea of going full velocity, 100 miles an hour, big spin rates. He, he really started focusing on pitching. And maybe he was throwing 92 to 94, but that was okay. And, he, and it seemed like after some initial struggles in spring training, he started getting some momentum. He had a rough first outing, but he looked better in his other outings at this, this regular season. And, and it's a shame if this is a, a bad situation for him, uh, it, it is a shame because you, you don't want to see a guy's career get cut short by injuries. Um, I can't imagine if this is a the worst case scenario. I don't I don't know how somebody can come back from a from another. You know, there's no third Tommy John surgeries usually, and I just don't no. see that for him. Um, but certainly, everyone's going to be rooting for him because you don't want to see a guy cut down like that. It's just it, for both players and anyone watching. It's it's very sad. It's. Uh, off on just to watch him walk off the field Sunday. Like, you know, we as reporters are there to report on the game, but we are also human beings. I like to think that you and me, Mark Sheldon, we are human. I might and be human, s- yes. <laughs> when you walk, uh, when you see an athlete who's done what he's done, that's had the impact that you just mentioned uh, on the team, and he has, and he walks off the field. Uh, it's just, it's difficult. Very, very difficult to it watch. Is. And he's very talented. When he was on, and especially before the second Tommy John surgery, he was as good as a reliever as there was in baseball. And and it's just, oh. it's a shame that his career uh, to this point has been ransacked by injuries. And, you know, hopefully the MRI is a good result and he has a, a, a positive outcome and maybe it's a rehab, but it's hard to say at this point. And certainly I, based on what you saw yesterday, it probably didn't look too good. So the Reds are nine games into this 2024 season. You can follow the rest of the season, certainly, and I hope you do, on MLB.com. Mark Sheldon does a terrific job, great job, since 2006. Is that correct? 2006 in Cincinnati, 2001 in Minnesota. Yeah, when you, you, your first season of MLB.com, yeah. Yes, yeah, so your first couple of years were with Guardy in Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, real quick, what was your favorite part of covering Ron Gardenhire? He kind of was similar to Dusty Baker. He could just was a real person and he talked very casually. He was funny. Um, he was intense too. He didn't like to lose. He was very competitive and he got it. He got the most out of a very kind of similar to what the Reds roster is. A lot of young players, mm-hmm. not a lot of heralded players, but he was a guy that got the most out of the roster he was given. And 
I, I covered the Twins for five seasons. He had uh, the last four he was there. The first season was Tom Kelly. He had four winning seasons when I was there, three times in the playoffs. Uh, and he just got the most out of a lot of guys that maybe other managers may not have gotten as much out of. So I, I just I think he was a, you know kind of like Dusty Baker. He could relate to a lot of different people and and make them feel important. And he certainly had a great relationship with the media and 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 just all around good guy in the game. And, and the game is better when he was in it. It's kind of a shame he's not managing right now, but he's a guy that certainly uh, made his mark in the game as a manager. All right. He is Mark Sheldon, does a great job covering the Reds for MLB.com. Mark, thanks so much for taking time out. Hey, Mike, thank you very much. It was, it was fun to do this. All right. All right. He's Mark Sheldon. I'm Mike Petralia Trags. Thanks for downloading this episode of Code Reds on the CLNS Media Network.